Good. Sure. Okay, dear guests, partners and donors, friends, I'm delighted to see so many uh, family faces at yet another expert panel that we're holding tonight. Uh, witnessing such a high interest in our discussions, we may hope that facilitating regular expert exchanges is vital for producing new discourses on the development trajectories of the Central Asian regions. Let me first thank our chair and moderator, Dr. Nargis Kasenova from Harvard University's Davis Center. We are very happy to see here Mr. George Kroll, a former United States ambassador to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, and now an uh, adjunct professor at U.S. Naval War College as our keynote speaker. Our brilliant speakers, uh, Mr. Iskander Akilbaev from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Dr. Uh, Gulaihan Kubayeva, an economist from the University of Salerno, and Ms. Tatiana Chernobyl, a lawyer and consultant on human rights, uh, on international human rights from Kazakhstan. I really cannot wait to hear your presentations. But first, uh, let me very briefly touch upon some technical regulations. First, we are holding this event on record and taking occasional snapshots. So in case you are not comfortable with that, please kindly inform uh, us by writing to our colleagues in chat box that they have an IWPR in their names. You may turn off your cameras as well, but we would appreciate if you please stay your cameras on that we have a sense of being together. Secondly, please drop your questions in the chat box uh, during the event. So we'll read them out when the times for the Queen A session comes. And thirdly, we understand the complexity of the topic and that it may instill some strong feelings. But I urge each and everyone in the audience to remain civil when asking questions during the Queen A and abide gender and conflict sensitivity. And finally, uh, uh, just to inform you that we have uh, interpretation uh, into Russian language. So my uh, announcement will be for Russian speaking that мы обеспечиваем синхронный перевод во время мероприятия. Поэтому, если вы хотите переключаться, переключиться на русский язык, пожалуйста, выберите русский язык на нижней панели Zoom со знаком Globus. Если у вас возникли проблемы, пожалуйста, напишите моим коллегам, которых вы можете найти в чате с припиской IWPR. So, thank you for your attention and for the welcoming remarks. I am passing the ball to IWPR Executive Director, Mr. Anthony Borden. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, I'm Tony Borden. I'm the Executive Director of IWPR, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today, this evening, afternoon, or morning, depending on where you may be sitting. This session is part of our ongoing series of virtual expert meetings on prospects and challenges for Central Asia. It is hosted by IWPR and our analytical platform, Kavar. The purpose of our programming is to strengthen the quality of research and policy analysis, particularly among the next generation who have such a stake in the future. The program is undertaken within IWPR's project Amplify, Verify, Engage, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia. This project is generously funded by the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm pleased to acknowledge Ambassador John Mikhail Kristad. We sincerely thank the Norwegian MFA for being our long-term donor, partner, and friend. As ever, I also want to thank and commend Abahan and our entire amazing Central Asia team who do such a fantastic job. The choice of topic of today's discussion stems from the recent traumatic events in Kazakhstan. We all know about the turmoil that took place at the start of the year, mass demonstrations that led to violence and tragedy. While human rights groups continue to research and report on those events, we thought it would be instrumental to talk about the prospects of future reforms as a response to the existing crisis laid out by the president in his January 11th presidential address. To that end, we have assembled a terrific expert panel, including young analysts, as well as prominent academic representatives that have been conceptualizing Kazakhstan's development. We thank them for taking part and for sharing their time and insights. 
Today's agenda highlights the key dimensions for reform that need to be targeted, political, economic, and in the field of civil society and human rights. The recent events have raised many urgent questions. What will Kazakhstan's political life be like after the reforms? How will policy change and what impact will it have on the country's economy and on people's daily lives? What awaits Kazakh civil society and will there be a new social contract between leadership and the people? And above all, can Kazakhstan turn this unfortunate episode into positive change so that there is a new reality on the ground? I am sure we will have more clarity after today's panel. I only close by saying how honored and proud we are to be holding this event tonight with our esteemed speakers, partners, and you, our guests, and we look forward to hosting more events in the future. And now I am very pleased to give the floor to today's event monitor, Dr. Nargis Casanova. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nargis Kasenova, and I'm a senior fellow uh, at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, running the center's program on uh, Central Asia. And uh, let me uh, welcome all of you today uh, to our discussion, uh, and also to say that I'm very honored to, uh, to moderate this session. Uh, let me first give the floor uh, to our keynote speaker, Ambassador George Kroll. Um, Probably many in the room know Ambassador Kroll. He is a career member of the uh, Senior Foreign Service. Uh, he served in many overseas uh, postings, including Tashkent and Astana. Uh, he was sworn in as uh, US ambassador in Kazakhstan um, in 2015 and was there until uh, 2018. Uh, he also served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of South and Central Asian Affairs. Uh, and he's currently teaching at the National War College. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Ambassador Kroll, the floor is yours. What's your, what's your take on the situation where we're heading, might be heading, uh, what's the potential for reforms? Well, thank you very much, Nargis, and thank you again to the organizers of this um, uh, meeting uh, with all of you. I, I, I'm rather intimidated when I see the names and faces of a number of people I know. Ole, nice to see you uh, from Norway, uh, Dick Hoagland, and others. So uh, it's rather intimidating, but of course, all the many uh, people that I know that are specialists and uh, academics and reporters that know far more about Kazakhstan than I do, and I've learned a lot over the years from you all, and I thank you for that. Uh, you know, it's been almost a month, almost to the day, since the start of events in Kazakhstan that uh, seem to have resulted in the consolidation of President Takayev's power and the final removal of Nursultan Nazarbayev and his family and closest courtiers from controlling the country's economy and politics. And what many have seen has started out as a popular demonstrations for largely economic and broad political purposes turned it seems into a power struggle at the top that included timely Russian involvement to resolve. Now the power politics aside, or rather with the power struggle at the top over, President Takayev seems now to be trying publicly to rally Kazakhstanis to support his leadership especially those who initially demonstrated and the many Kazakhstanis quietly discontented with the stagnation, the excesses, the artifice of the late Nazarbayev period. The president also seems to wish to assure the outside world and current and future investors that his leadership will bring all Kazakhstanis together peacefully to strengthen Kazakhstan's position and reputation as a politically and economically stable, progressive and reliable partner. However, in order to obtain the trust of the Kazakhstani people, and I would say much of the rest of the world community who were stunned by the violence of the January events, President Takayev and his government must also address convincingly the tragic side of those events, the unprecedented killings, the beatings, the disappearances and the detentions that are being reported on almost daily now uh, by many who are following the situation. Uh, he has to, the, the government has to do something about it credibly 
and bring people to responsibility in the eyes of the people of Kazakhstan and in the world community and potential investors, I would say. Now, although he was a senior member of the Nazarbayev establishment, so to speak, President Takayev has sought to distance himself from the Nazarbayev period. He has declared the primary goal as leader is the establishment of a new Kazakhstan with a government and policies that will address, as he says, the needs and desires of the majority of the Kazakhstanis, uh, the Kazakhstani people, rather than the small elite who grew rich and powerful over these past 30 years. Now, as I see it, a key question today's panel will address and probably will not be able to answer definitively is fundamentally, will and can President Takayev and his government undertake real and significant steps to reform Kazakhstan as President Takayev asserts they will, or is this just a rhetorical exercise to pacify the majority of discontented Kazakhstanis and prevent Kazakhstanis from demonstrating publicly for change or, or having a voice in change, even more, more importantly, perhaps, than demonstrations. Uh, and is it anything more than a, a public relations effort designed to impress outside audiences, particularly in the West, where Kazakhstan seeks to attract investment and improve its image after the January events? I guess time will tell. However, if this is more than a rhetorical exercise, other significant questions emerge, which have been raised already, which can Kazakhstan's current leadership, its government and its bureaucracy really transform the system it itself embodies to really share power and control with those currently outside of it. If the reform impulse is genuine, Will or should the reform be rapid or evolutionary? Will it come from the top or below? What will be the priority of reforms, the sequencing? All these questions, as we say, the devil in the details. Who and how, who will make these re uh, decisions on reforms? How will they be decided? How will they be imp implemented? Now, I would note that change or reform by its very nature is disruptive of traditional ways of governing and doing business. There always seem to be those who wish to maintain their positions, their authority and control in the existing system and those who seek to redistribute it or take it away from them. Conflicts can ensue with unpredictable results as we even saw 30 years ago when the Soviet Union collapsed, largely as a result of Gorbachev's own reform efforts. Now, in this context, it's also worth reflecting on the experience of the countries that emerged suddenly from the collapse of the Soviet Union, including Kazakhstan. At the time of independence, many of us recall all the leadership sought or gave lip service to economic, political, and security reform. Expectations were high inside and outside these countries that genuine change would occur that would rapidly improve people's lives and bring stability, security, freedom, and prosperity. The reality of that change across the former Soviet Union has by and large turned out quite differently from those expectations. Moreover, over the last 30 years, practically every leadership change in the former Soviet Union, like in Turkmenistan, Ukraine, Russia, Kyrgyzstan, and even most recently, in Uzbekistan, virtually everywhere. This has been accompanied by expectations of change and the new leadership's pronounced commitment to pursue cardinal reforms. But in many of these cases, the results have not met those expectations. Now it's the, it's the new leadership in Kazakhstan's turn. So summing up, as we discuss reforming Kazakhstan 2.0 today, it's worthwhile to keep this past in mind, as well as the real difficulties of conducting change and reform in any society, and I would add, including my own, the United States. Now, one last comment I would make. As a professional diplomat, I can say that successful diplomacy usually means no one at the negotiating table is 100% satisfied with the result. A successful result almost invariably consists of difficult, sometimes unpleasant compromises. But it's a result that at least advances everyone's basic interests somewhat, although not maximally. It is usually peaceful, but 
it's often accompanied by high drama and tension, usually behind closed doors. And finally, that result can be sold successfully to key stakeholders domestically and internationally. Now, I would hope that President Dekayev, himself a professional diplomat with deep experience in the art of diplomacy and compromise, will be able to achieve such a success as president for the people of Kazakhstan. And I, for one, wish him, and most importantly, the people of Kazakhstan, well in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kroll. Um, you put a lot, a lot on the table, and uh, um, and I think it's very accurate to uh, to focus on uh, sequencing and on the disruptions. And clearly, uh, reforms are disruptive. But the kind of the, the uh, in our situation, there are already major disruptions, uh, disruptions in in the country. So it's a very very sensitive uh, sensitive moment, uh, and um, I, I would. I would agree that the, the kind of the proper sequencing is is very important, uh, and the um, and building up credibility in the eyes of the people is very important, and building credibility in the eyes of the international community is also is also very very important. Uh, now let's turn to um, um, our next speaker, uh, Iskander Kalbaev. He's also not a new face to many uh, many in this room. Uh, Iskander is a scholar from Kazakhstan. He uh, he served as executive director of the Kazakhstan Council of International Relations. He was also a senior fellow at the Kazakhstan Institute for uh, Strategic Studies under the president of Kazakhstan. And he's currently completing his uh, second second MA. Uh, uh, in uh, public administration at uh, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in uh, in Singapore. Uh, so, uh, Iskander, what's uh, what's your take? Uh, um, and uh, what, what what political and security reforms uh, you think are possible? Well, first of all, thank you very much for organizers and for the distinguished speakers and uh, all participants from different parts of the world taking uh, joining the session on the very important topic uh, as an ordinary citizen from Kazakhstan the tragic events uh, which started in early January was very unexpected but I think um, we it, it can be a barrier and but at the same time a bridge to uh, ref real reform Kazakhstan so uh, taking into account what what happened we see that the if you take security part, uh, it's not about, only about the national security, it's also about the social economic aspect, because the social economic aspect that trigger, triggered actually the protest in the, uh, the western part of Kazakhstan, in the oil-rich uh, part of Kazakhstan, and moved fastly to the political dimension and then to the violent uh, riots. So basically what we see is, uh, uh, which was state, uh, state, uh, stated and emphasized is social injustice, um, uh, some level of quite a big level of corruption, which has been existing and was in the air, people were discussing that. Uh, specific, uh, specifically taking, if you look at the, the, the protest, the protest was led in the Kazakh language. So Kazakh led protest, it tells us about demography, it tells us about the cultural shift from the, the Russian speaking to the Kazakh speaking uh, groups of people and it's becoming a majority. So it's a very big differences which were happening before. Uh, rural urban context divide is still is early there. So if you take into account the uh, language aspect, if you take into account rural uh, urban divide, 42, 45% of Kazakh population lives in uh, rural areas. So it's a very big shift. And this uh, uh, kind of social inequality, economic inequality between urban and rural areas, which has been existing in Kazakhstan for a long time, it actually became a vivid uh, result of the protest. So it's very important security aspect if you take into account the reforming social and economic aspect of Kazakhstan. And uh, the second point I would like to make is uh, certainly as Ambassador Kroll uh, rightly mentioned, despite even uh, on the official scene, we see that there is no political uh, competition between the elites. We, we can say that there is a mutual trust and understanding between president, former president Nazarbayev and uh, current president Tokayev. But certainly on the on the sidelines, on the certain 
uh, level, we see the some political groupings, uh, interest groups were competing with each other, uh, maybe in the shadows, but this kind of uh, recent arrests and custodies of the prominent politicians uh, and like figures, uh, it became pr uh, actually vivid that uh, for the last two and a half years where President Tokai had been serving as a president, the, the reforms and the moves on his side were more uh, reluctant, reluctantly accepted by the certain uh, group of elites. So in this respect, not everybody was happy with his appointment. Uh, this is what we actually can analyze and see. Uh, the third point of the protests, we, uh, after the situation stabilized or during the, the last days of this violent uh, process, the, the, there was a new appointment of uh, cabinet of ministers, new prime minister was appointed. Then we see the resignation or where the, or where the former prominent figures from the Nazarbayev family were uh, outposted from the key uh, economic, from the key position from, of economy, politics. So we, we see this shift, uh, not only in terms of the personality, the per, uh, personnel, but also from this older uh, regime type and older, older values. And in this respect, uh, we, we, we can expect that because this is a very uh, sensitive time. President Okayev may accept this collective approach where he would like to uh, uh, have much more kind of maybe less prominent uh, allies in terms of the, the publicity, but more he would like to uh, emphasize, uh, focus on the technocrats rather than politicians. So I think it's, it will be a very important aspect uh, where uh, technocrats will play much more important role than the politicians and they will more or less uh, neutral in their political standing. So it's number three. So number four, uh, we need to look at this kind of ch uh, current changes in the uh, government, economy, the statements and rhetoric through the forthcoming presidential elections in two years. So 2024 will have a new presidential elections and President Dukai has two years to execute and show the uh, Kazakh society that he's able to really reform. So it will be a really, uh, it's, it's a very important time for him just really convince people because it's not easy. Uh, the population is quite fragment, uh, fragmented and polarized these days. Uh, uh, what I can see from the journalists on the field is that society in Kazakhstan become very much, very much politicized. Looking at the social network, Telegram channels, WhatsApp chats, etc. So, any position, any appointment is regarded is uh, going through the criticism, some some support, etc. So, in general sense, uh, the society became much more aware what is happening on the political side and economy. So, I think this is one of the maybe positive aspects that, uh, that are happening because civil society uh, gained much more uh, spaces for maneuvering and addressing the demands to the government. And number four, or uh, number five, I think uh, the foreign policy aspect should be also taken into account as seriously. The CSTO presence uh, with the limited troops uh, uh, from Russia, from Belarus, Ar Armenia and Kyrgyzstan certainly uh, became a question and agenda during that days. Uh, and there is a big back and forth, what does it, what, what it will mean for Kazakhstan in medium and uh, uh, long-term perspective. In this respect, uh, in, in, like I am as an analyst, as a foreign policy analyst, it's very interesting for me, like how CSTO will react, for example, not only in Ka on Kazakhstan case, but what's happening over Ukraine, for example. So, because this will also at some point raise up questions from the Russian side. Hey, we actually came to support Kazakhstan in difficult times uh, as, as CSTO. Will CSTO be active on the Ukrainian front? So this question I think will be on the air in, in a short -term period of time. So in this respect, this is my five points that I wanted to discuss and takeaways from the protest. Thank you very much, Iskander. Uh, can I ask you, Two clarifying questions. First, uh, you talk, uh, uh, you kind of put 
technocrats versus politicians. Who are politicians in the Kazakhstani context, given the, you know, how so, it's lack, lack of political parties and the political competition in this regard, and also the old regime versus new regime. So uh, one difference you kind of note is that technocrats will play a bigger role. Are there any other features? you think, I mean, we, we don't know, but what, what your projection is. And uh, also, do you see it sort of similar to the 90s when uh, the, the so-called Turkey Young Turks were brought into the government? Uh, when I'm speaking about technocrats, uh, I'm talking about political neutrality, people who are not, uh, do not have a history working inside the government machine, government body. So people who are from the outside and more, uh, sticking to more effective uh, execution of the program uh, or any degree. So the people from uh, various backgrounds who didn't work as a public servant, I think they will have much more say in this respect. And this is my take, like it will be more, much more pragmatic aspect. People who were upraised uh, at maybe at the age of 40, 35, that will be this uh, mid carry drivers of uh, Kazakh, uh, reforms. This is, uh, and you know, this is, there is a presidential reserve for people who are in their mid carriers, and there is a big focus on them these days, like how they are going to be uh, engaged into the political reforms. So what their what role they are going to play, or other people who are who didn't have much more say before. So I think in this respect, politicians who have much more experience in political aspect, but they were. Uh, Kind of active uh, prior to January 2022. So I think President Tokai would like to distance himself from the people who are at some sort uh, can be affiliated with some political groups or interest groups of the previous uh, type of regime. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's uh, let's move to our next speaker, uh, also a scholar from uh, from Kazakhstan, uh, Gulaykhan Kubaeva, uh, who is a PhD student in public economics at the University of Salerno in Italy. Gulaykhan, what's your take on the economic reforms? Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay. Uh, good evening, dear participants, dear experts and uh, speakers. Uh, my name is Gorehan Kubaeva, and it's a great pleasure to participate in this discussion. Um, so today I'm going to discuss mostly economic part of uh, what President uh, Tokayev has addressed after the tragic events in January. Uh, basically, in the beginning of January, after these events, he has addressed the citizens and shared his vision for the economic reforms. And later, in the uh, on the 21st of January, he also met with uh, business executives of Kazakhstan and called them to actively participate uh, in improving the investment climate of the country. So, uh, talking about uh, most important um, elements of his speech, we can say that most importantly, the president acknowledged that the government's failure to work effectively to address several uh, many social and economic affairs, such as corruption or rising economic inequality and other issues has led to this uh, tragic events in January. And, um, uh, he particularly mentioned, uh, mentioned the sharp inequality in income distribution, although during the last decades, Kazakhstan's economy has been growing um, and showing basically uh, sustainable growth, although the distribution among citizens and also among different types of business has been uh, growing in different parts. And uh, it, that it's very important to bridge the gap between the wealth, wealthy minority and the struggling majority, uh, which has been the, um, the trigger for the turmoil in January. And he also mentioned that the government has begun drafting a new bankruptcy law covering individual bankruptcies, as well as creation of a public social fund, which is called for the people of Kazakhstan. Uh, which will be capitalized by taxing wealthy income groups and companies which are active in the mineral sector, and that uh, these uh, initiatives should solve uh, this income in Kazakhstan. Uh, but also he uh, raised the importance that it's um, 
it's significant to support small and medium enterprises versus large enterprises in Kazakhstan, and that uh, this income inequality regarded not only citizens. So uh, by highlighting that private business is the core of national growth and therefore uh, Um, so this enterprises has been beneficiaries of the economic growth um, in Kazakhstan and the oligarchic groups during the independence years has grown. And this uh, situation exacerbates oligopoly in the, in the economy rather than uh, providing uh, fair uh, competition for all the participants of the market. Uh, he also addressed some the problems regarding the inefficiency of government programs and that government mostly supported, again, large enterprises uh, versus uh, small and medium enterprises and that the implementation mechanisms of government programs should be clear and concise as versus being uh, more complicated and difficult to apply. And uh, as we also know, there are a lot of quasi-state organizations in the economy of Kazakhstan and uh, uh, president has um, uh, mentioned that it's very important to that the government intervention in the economy should be reduced a lot. Uh, he suggested reforming the so sovereign wealth fund Samro Kazna, which owns uh, around 600 state enterprises, and he called that this uh, um, the enterprises which should work in a private environment they should be privatized and that uh, the efficiency of these companies should be raised and uh, that uh, some other uh, development organizations provided by the uh, fund uh, uh, the development bank of kazakhstan are have been also favoring larger enterprises and a specific circle of individuals which represented financial industrial and construction groups of the country so uh, in sum, the major trajectories of this uh, prospective uh, reforms, economic reforms, uh, were the inviolability of private property, uh, increasing transparency in all aspects, for example, in, implement, in, in implementing government programs, in uh, tax policies, and also reforming judicial system, basically increasing transparency in all terms, improving the investment climate through uh, providing fair competition and eliminating artificial monopolies or the, the companies which could be transferred into a more competitive environment and reducing the number of quasi-state organizations. Um, so talking about the feasibility of this uh, major, uh, also can be called radical reforms, uh, it's important to say that such reforms have been initiated before also in, in Kazakhstan, uh, but the most important part is how these programs are going to be implemented. So uh, although this speech was highly welcomed and grew hopes among population. Most of the experts view they remain critical opinion about this uh, programs because it's still unclear how they will be implemented, what kind of uh, performance indicators will be used. And um, uh, in my opinion that the given periods like uh, one month or two months for the development of such programs has been quite short and it's, uh, it's difficult to to develop uh, something fundamentally important in such short periods. So it's important that uh, civil society will grow accountability on these statements, that they will be following um, how these programs will be imp implemented and which uh, key performance indicators will be used for that. Um, so I'm excited for these changes, but it's also important to know the time frames, the mechanisms, and scale of implementation of such uh, of these changes. And um, I join the opinion of many experts that while suggestions of President Tokayev are interesting and radical, it's more important to follow the implementation process. Thank you very much. This is, in short, what I wanted to express. Thank you very much, Kulaihan. What do you think is going to happen to the Astana International Finance Center? Do you have any <laughs> guesses? Um, 
does it fit into these reforms or not? Mm. To be honest, no. As uh, the main goal of this uh, agency, I think it fits quite well in these reforms in the sense that it's uh, it aims to uh, basically improve the investment, uh, uh, the investment climate in the country to attract private investors from abroad, as well as increasing the uh, financial literacy of the citizens. So. Um, I envision that this agency will continue working so far. Okay. But as of now, it has been losing money, so I don't know. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go. Thank you very much, Glehan. Uh, let's move to our next speaker, last but definitely not least. Uh, uh, let's uh, talk about the human rights um, uh, situation, civil society and human rights situation. And for that, we will go to Tatiana Chernobyl, who is a human rights lawyer and independent consultant from Almaty. Uh, Kazakhstan, she specializes in human rights monitoring, advocacy, and training on issues of fundamental freedoms, non-discrimination, freedom from torture, police accountability, uh, and others. And she's an expert member of the Coalition of NGOs of Kazakhstan Against Torture. Tatiana, the floor is yours. I know you'll be speaking in Russian, so uh, sorry. translation, please uh, switch. Uh, I guess you need to switch the, the, the channel. I'm not sure. Abakhon, they need to switch the channel, right? Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, please oh, go. No, no. If, yeah. if, if you're following the discussion in uh, Russian, then you don't have to switch the channel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Спасибо, Наргиз. Права человека для государства в Казахстане – это, мы должны констатировать, удобный политический инструмент а, увы, не цель или, как хотелось бы, образ жизни, то есть отнюдь не основа для государственного менеджмента. Для казахстанского правительства права человека – это некий удобный инструмент управления внутри страны и неудобный, но неизбежный инструмент разговора при выстраивании отношений со странами ЕС и США. Поэтому существующей государственной поддержки в осуществлении своих прав человека казахстанцы обязаны э, часто не самим себе по праву своего рождения человеком, а интересам государства. Но цель ави. Хотя бы так, как мы говорим. И основной рычаг правозащитников остается naming and shaming. Инициативы президента Токаева в сфере прав человека на сегодня касались выборочных прав, что интересно, не всех. Почему? Хороший вопрос. А мы имеем то, что в нарушение принципа неделимости и взаимозависимости прав человека приоритетными или первоочередными, как их говорят, объявляются лишь отдельные права. По международным стандартам в области прав человека поэтапное или постепенно полное, как это называется, обеспечение государством реализации прав человека допустимо, как известно, лишь в отношении экономических, социальных и культурных прав человека. И то при этом, я цитирую, всеми надлежащими способами вне всякой дискриминации и, главное, опять цитирую, в максимальных пределах имеющихся у государства ресурсов. А вот по гражданским и политическим правам эти права вовсе не допускают отсроченного выполнения государством своих относительно них обязательств. Тем не менее, в июне 2021 года президент Токаев постановил утвердить в качестве, как он сказал, первоочередных права жертв торговли людьми и граждан с инвалидностью. Отдельно отметил также ликвидацию дискриминации в отношении женщин, а из гражданских и политических прав были отмечены следующие. Право на свободу объединения, право на свободу выражения мнения, право человека на жизнь и общественный порядок, а также, цитирую, права человека в области уголовного правосудия, исполнение наказаний 
и предупреждения пыток и жестокого обращения. И еще было непонятное – повышение эффективности взаимодействия с неправительственными организациями. Видимо, это право призвано заместить право на участие в управлении делами государства. Президент, надо сказать, остается последовательным в этой своей политике в области прав человека. Так, из раздела «Право на жизнь» мы смогли констатировать в прошлом году отмену, наконец, смертной казни. Однако теперь, как все знают, после приказа президента Токаева стрелять на поражение в ходе январских событий, с этим правом в Казахстане серьезные проблемы. Из раздела «Право граждан с инвалидностью» можно отметить готовящуюся ратификацию факультативного протокола Конвенции ООН по правам инвалидов. Законопроект в настоящее время находится на рассмотрении уже в Сенате. Про взаимодействие с НПО и про право на свободу объединения. Тут интересное. В этой части государством были предложены две инициативы. Это закон об общественном контроле и институт онлайн-петиций. Про эти права можно отметить. Государству важно, как мы видим, если не удобное, то по крайней мере предсказуемое гражданское общество, с которым, так сказать, можно работать. Предсказуемое гражданское общество исключает спонтанность, как, например, стихийные мирные собрания или случай стихийного общественного возмущения в ответ, скажем, на какую-то правительственную инициативу, которые на самом деле будут ответной реакцией на такие правительственные инициативы и не будут совсем уж стихийными. Так вот, законопроект об общественном контроле подробно регулирует все, что касается общественного контроля. Так в нем дается определение субъект и объект общественного контроля, права и обязанности этих субъектов и объектов, закрепляются формы общественного контроля и, обратите внимание, регламентируются условия участия в общественном контроле. А мы говорим о неотъемлемом праве человека, право на, свободу, право на участие в управлении делами государства. То есть не всякому будут доступны возможности общественного контроля. А для понимания, в мире такие законы есть, например, в Российской Федерации и Азербайджане. На вопрос, зачем нужен этот закон, правительство ссылается на эффективность или необходимость эффективного сотрудничества общества с государством или государства с обществом, исповедуя принцип «слышащее государство». По большому счету, точного ответа правительства на вопрос «зачем?» с точки зрения прав человека не получено. Аналогично было с ситуацией другой недавней. Это инициатива правительства, когда под предлогом борьбы с кибербуллингом депутаты парламента с поддержки Министерства информации <coughs> собирались обязать ведущие интернет-платформы мира разместить свои представительства в Казахстане с непременным назначением их руководителями граждан Казахстана, которые должны были при получении, в частности, уведомления от этого министерства удалить оспариваемый контент. В противном случае ресурс грозил быть заблокирован. К счастью, эта инициатива немного трансформировалась, трансформировалась и, по крайней мере, от регистрации представительств в Казахстане отказались, но инициатива запущена и ждет финализации. И по последнему из первоочередных прав – право на свободу от пыток. В недавнем интервью гостелеканалу «Хабар» президент Токаев так отозвался о массовых сообщениях о пытках. «Есть большая доля преувеличения, — говорит Токаев, — в подобного рода заявлениях. Полиция Казахстана не перегибала ли палку? Я не оправдываю незаконные действия полиции, если таковые имеются. Поэтому я дал поручение Генеральной прокуратуре по каждому случаю проводить расследование. 
На фоне растущего числа сообщений о пытках задержанных в результате январских событий, что будет с обязательствами государства в части теперь расследования этих случаев, нам предстоит увидеть. Без эффективного расследования всех сообщений о пытках, о пытках, а эффективно это прежде всего независимое расследование, а независимого органа расследования пыток в Казахстане нет, боюсь народного доверия выводом официального расследования по самим событиям не последует. Все инициативы по правам человека президента Токаева на сегодня, боюсь, оказались, если не похоронены, то были затменены, во-первых, его приказом тем самым стрелять на поражение, в результате чего погибли заведомо для стрелявших, а это были причастные государству структуры или силы мирных граждан. Во-вторых, Косвенным обвинением в развитии разыгравшейся трагедии правозащитников, активистов и мирных протестующих. И в-третьих, волной сообщений об ужасающих пытках в условиях задержания. Вот этих задержанных по этим событиям. Настораживают также настойчивые напоминания президента придерживаться закона при проведении мирных собраний. Закона, любое отступление от которого при организации или проведении мирных собраний способно повлечь даже арест. Ожидает ли нас рассвет или закат прав человека? Покажет, насколько президент Токаев выйдет из сложившейся на сегодня ситуации. Президент ситуацию больше свободы своим гражданам либо наоборот, использует ее в оправдании своей позиции контролирующего государства, которому важно дозировать пользование гражданами своих прав человека. Поживем, увидим. Спасибо. Спасибо большое, Татьяна. Вот вы упомянули этот приказ несколько раз открывать огонь на поражение и... В общем-то, если почитать его речь, и потом в этом интервью телеканалу Хабар, он говорит, я сделал приказ, как бы отдал приказ стрелять на поражение по, по вооруженным бандитам. Да? А как вы сами объясняете себе, да? почему он отдал этот этот приказ, и также есть ли проблема в самом приказе, есть ли проблема в выполнении этого, в выполнении этого приказа. И второй момент. Вы знаете, как работает наш силовой сектор, и, конечно, это не проблема, то, что произошло, трагедия, пытки, это не что-то абсолютно новое для нашей системы. У нас у нас это большая системная, системная проблема. В принципе, как бы то, что произошло, это вот он и big scale, как бы в большом масштабе, то, что мы видели в Жанаузене, допустим. Да, там тоже были пытки, там тоже была стрельба и так далее. Вот, а, а, вот как, как бы что, что вот здесь надо, надо менять, что можно поменять, что так, президент Такаев может поменять а, а, в этой системе. Как ну, бы это была бы самая большая реформа, которую как бы, вот, хотелось бы видеть. Да. По первому вопросу относительно приказа стрелять на поражение, то есть э, фактически это без предупреждения, можно сказать, на месте стрелять. Э, этот приказ уместен в военных условиях. Возможно, он уместен в условиях антитеррористической операции. А было ли это эксцессом, как говорят, исполнителя? то есть превышением полномочий или нет, наверное, должно нам сказать следствие. И вот это, кстати, будет очень интересно, как будут синтерпретированы вот эти, эти события следствием. Очень интересно, как, как к этому подойдут. Потому что вот эти смерти, они ждут объяснения. Смерти мирных граждан, я имею в виду. Любое примирение, применение силы силовыми структурами, оно должно быть законным, оно должно быть необходимым, 
оно должно быть пропорциональным обстоятельствам и адекватным этим обстоятельствам. В отношении мирных граждан, которые были расстреляны, не побоюсь этого слова, 6 января, мы не видели этой необходимости, необходимости применения огнестрельного оружия. Мы не видели, что такое отражение, даже не знаю отражение, собственно, чего, потому что со стороны тогда мирных демонстрантов с этой растяжкой, которые стояли с баннером на площади, совершенно безоружные, совершенно уязвимые в тот момент для военных, насколько вообще необходима была любая сила в тот момент, каким, каким бы чрезвычайным ни было тогда положение, для меня непонятно, конечно. Это, это выглядит как расстрел. По поводу второго вопроса, что нужно бы сделать, чтобы в случае подобным женозению 2011 года и этим случаем, ну, по крайней мере, с пытками не подтвердились, для меня, которая достаточно давно уже работает по праву на свободу от пыток, я считаю, я всегда об этом говорю, с пытками только хардкор. Никакого пряника, только кнут. Я говорю о неотвратимости наказания. Потому что на всем том фоне очень многих заявлений или сообщений, если не заявлений, о пытках мы видим очень небольшое число обвинительных приговоров. Я не говорю про сегодняшние события, я говорю в целом по стране. То есть этих ежегодно коалиция НПО Казахстана против пыток получает стабильно. Эта цифра почти не меняется. 200, около 200, 200 плюс вот таких обращений по пыткам и менее тяжким видам обращения или наказания. Что мы имеем а, на выходе? Мы имеем ну, 4-5, может быть, дел, которые дойдут до суда, и а, приговоров может быть тоже очень, меньше-меньше даже этого числа. А, что становится потом с этими людьми, которые будут признаны судом виновными, будет ли это наказание изменено в надзорной инстанции, статистика этого не показывает, какой по-настоящему срок отбудут в условиях лишения свободы эти люди, статистика тоже этого не показывает. Еще очень настораживает то, что в последнее время со стороны представителей власти слышатся призывы к примирению или прощению, но нужно понимать, что попыткам, например, вообще невозможно никакая амнистия, невозможно примирение и невозможен, в Казахстане его нет, невозможно применение срока давности. Вот. Спасибо большое. Мне кажется, тут это, это, это очень важный момент, что это, это часть Назарбаевской системы, то что, то, что как бы вот вышло в таком ужасном, ужасном виде. Но мы еще живем в Назарбаевской системе, конечно. И в этом смысле, может быть, хорошо, что, что все это настолько высветилось, что все эти темные моменты нашей системы, они настолько вот сейчас как бы в центре внимания общества, уже никто не может игнорировать, мне кажется. Да. А, эти очень неприглядные, а, неприглядные моменты. А, хорошо, а let's, um, let's, open, uh, let's open the, the discussion. Um, and we already received, uh, received uh, questions. Uh, the first question is from um, Ambassador, Ambassador Hoagland. Um, um, I understand we're discussing reforms. Or, Ambassador Hoagland, do you want to... Do you want to ask yourself, or would you prefer me to read the question? <laughs> uh, you know, Nargis, sorry, uh, unfortunately, only speaker and... Uh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, you cannot unmute. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm very sorry. Okay, I'm, I'm very sorry. Then I will read. Yes, 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 Thank sorry. You. 
Uh, I understand we're discussing reforms, but I'm concerned that Western reporting is increasingly conflating uh, two concurrent events, the economic protests and the violent attempted coup attempt. Can anyone discuss who and what was behind the coup attempt and why uh, it was so violent? Well, the only thing I would add here that there were the protest started as economic protests, but pretty much right away became political. That's something. Who wants to take this one? Iskander, do you want to give the first step? Okay, well, I will try to elaborate on what on the Ambassador Hoblin's question. So um, you're right. Um, the economic aspect triggered the social economic injustice, which was there for many years. Uh, became the main reason for the protest and the triggering point for the protest. Who were behind? And according to official rhetoric, we see that the the former head of powerful head of intelligence service, uh, KNB, uh, was was taken into the custody for uh, treason uh, accusation, uh, and uh, one of the the higher up ranking uh, affiliates were also taken into the custody and accused. We see a very interesting processes and trends where some former affiliates of the former head of intelligence service uh, conducted suicide. And uh, uh, we, there are many different like conspiracies and different opinions on that, who, whether the, the former head of the intelligence service was a so, the only person who was behind or not, whether he had somebody from the other powerful groups who were assisting him. So I think we have two options. Whether we're going to really disclose who are uh, additional personnel, additional people, or we will never know. So in this respect, uh, from another signals, what we see is that President Tokayev actually stressed upon the, the fact that we are not going to drastically, like, you know, uh, outpost and uh, uh, take, uh, to take the, the, the for, maybe former politicians, et cetera, for, from the kind of uh, political theme. Uh, and in this respect, I think it's more likely and seems to be more like Deng Xiaoping's approach towards Mao Zedong. Yeah, where we acknowledge the past, we acknowledge the positive pluses, and we acknowledge the minuses. So in this respect, I think uh, we have, we might know maybe limited information, but at the same time, due to the maybe political reasons, we may not know the full picture for a long time. Thank you, Skander. Um... Uh, do other speakers want to add to that? I have a couple of comments I can add. Ambassador Kroll, do you want to? No. Um, let, let me add, because I'm also, you know, from Kazakhstan, I've been following <laughs> these events nonstop. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it, it's difficult even for us, uh, people in Kazakhstan, you know, to those who kind of have access to different sources of information, um, to understand what, what actually happened and a lot of things happened. And that's not just the protests that went violent. No, it, the, uh, uh, it's kind of, I think it's what, what happened actually defies a simple kind of like com common narrative, this or that. Um, and um, the, the, the protests I think were genuine, you know, caused, caused by the, the grievances, but then uh, some, third force appeared, right? Uh, now it's sort of common to refer to it as the, as the third force and some of the violence seems to, uh, to have been orchestrated um, on the 5th of uh, January in Almaty and some other, uh, some other cities. And, uh, um, and it seems that there was an attempted, uh, attempted coup d'etat and there are some, uh, well, people, but there are some suspicions, as Iskander said, like there are various conspiracy theories going around. Uh, um, and it seems kind of the <laughs> most fingers are pointed at the kind of younger generation. Uh, and the, the uh, I think kind of uh, uh, there is understanding that it wasn't uh, just Karim Masimov, you know, um, uh, who was involved in it. And actually, to me, it's a big question, what was his role uh, in this particular, uh, you, know, you know, in all of this. Uh, in terms of, oh, and I also suspect we will not know the whole truth, but, uh, uh, 
but uh, some of it, I think we should, <laughs> we should get. And if, uh, if it's just, you know, kind of as the, as a result of the final investigation, uh, Karim Masimov will be given as the kind of the main, uh, <laughs> the mastermind of, uh, of this. And um, nobody in the family, for example, would be you know, accused. I think the society will find it not very credible. Uh, we need, um, we need a credible explanation uh, of uh, uh, of what happened. In terms of violence, there was a lot of, obviously, there was a lot of violence, and I would divide, there was, there was a violence of the police against the protesters, uh, there was, uh, which is quite, quite usual, you know, stun grenades, tear gas, beating, beatings, de detentions, that's something that we have seen on a regular basis uh, in the country. Then uh, on the 5th of January, you know, I think there was violence. Uh, there was violence against law enforcement. There was uh, violence by uh, by by bandits. You know, they, they, they some some people who kind of descended on the uh, on the city. Um, uh, and from the six, as as uh, Tatiana uh, um, described and addressed, from the six, there was there was violence as part of this counter terrorist uh, operation uh, operation in the country and. Um, and innocent people, many innocent people were, were killed and it was, the shooting was indiscriminate. Uh, so, so it's just, you know, conflation. Um, there's a lot of violence against, uh, um, uh, there's a lot of violence. Uh, and and I, I do hope that we will, um, we will have a decent investigation. Uh, the good thing is that uh, the society, the, the society also uh, collects information. It's not just the government that is investigating. Uh, I would say the society is also investigating, collect, collecting information, uh, and trying to understand what actually uh, what actually happened. Uh, and international organizations as well, like Human Rights Watch, uh, is uh, also collecting collecting data, doing digital forensics, and uh, and so on and so forth. So so I, I hope collectively collectively we can recover kind of most of the truth um, eventually. So, because it happened in Almaty, it's the biggest city with all these people who, who, saw, who saw things with their, own, uh, with their own eyes. You can, I think it's impossible really to hide um, uh, the story. Okay, uh, okay, I'm a moderator. Let me return to the, <laughs> to the role of the uh, moderator. And there is a question to, um, to Iskander. Um, is uh, is there a possibility you think that president will attract representatives of civil society, um, businessmen, political scientists, former uh, former public servants that are you know opinion makers uh, such as Dosim Satpaev, Morgulan Sisimbaev, Mukhtar Jagishev, and others? Well, this is a quite popular trend these days, and uh, in um, this. Uh, among the journalists, among the public uh, opinion leaders, and, uh, among the youngster, younger generation, there is a certain a talk of uh, uh, people who are from the outside, uh, who served uh, and got into this political ex exile or work in a business, become very popular. So it also, I mean, uh, I actually uh, read some opinions, and it's one of the the, the interviews of Mukhtar Jakishak when he when he told, "If I'm being, if I'm asked to come." and help the government as an advisor, for example. I will only help, come help if I can really do something to conduct the reforms. If I come just to, uh, as a political technology tool, I won't be uh, kind of allowing to, it to happen. So it also depends on the intention, what kind of intention the government will have like uh, by bringing those people. But if you take into account this idea that by collective governing, like collecting different opinions from different sectors and putting them into the decision-making process. I think this is, will be really important for Kazakh society, for Kazakhstan as a, as a country to move forward and to be able to uh, gain a new political culture in a governing process. But if, if, if it's only for uh, just uh, to make a society calmer in their expectations and demands, I don't think it's going to be in long term a very productive move. So it depends on an intention and it depends on the implementation implementation of those policies 
uh, that has been addressed to the society. How hopeful are you about this? Uh, I'm always uh, very uh, kind of cautious optimist in this respect, but cautious, I think, is the key word here. Uh, I would like to uh, believe that it's possible certainly to reform uh, Kazakhstan, I mean, at least gradually, at least in some sectors, but I think we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go to, to really address the kind of comprehensive systematic uh, the way and basically to reform the decision-making culture, the perception how Kazakhstan can be or like, but, but usually all habits die hard. Yeah, we're still in the, in the beginning of the process. Um, thank, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Ambassador Kroll, yes, you wanted to say something, but actually, can I add to that, um, add to that a question for, for you, actually? Uh, we are asked to compare developments in Kazakhstan to developments in other Central Asian countries, like, uh, well, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, and I wonder if you can compare um, this transition in Uzbekistan, Karimov, you know, Mirziyoev, <laughs> to what's happening in Kazakhstan. Well, I, I did refer to it uh, in my uh, opening remarks that uh, where you had a change in Uzbekistan, uh, immediately there are expectations uh, from outside and inside that there would be major changes. And uh, the new president, Mirziyoyev, said basically many of the same things that President Takayev has said that frankly, there'll be a new Uzbekistan. It will be a more open, it will listen to people and many of the, um, the, the, the policies would change in order to be more open uh, with relations with neighbors, but also between the citizenry, the people and the government. And there would be more listening and more attention paid to uh, opening up the system to, to other views. And this was all rhetorical and, you know, and, and, and we see uh, and I, ha I was not present in Uzbekistan when the change happened, and I, I've been following it, uh, and I think there's been good reporting and things like that out of there. Um, but I would say, as we would say, the jury is still out. It's a very difficult process, as it will be in Kazakhstan, which leads me to my comment is that uh, in my own experience of being a bureaucrat, bureaucracies are very difficult to change in and of themselves. The whole, their, their whole ethos is maintaining, maintaining an order and a way of doing things. And to ask for a bureaucracy to change itself and to get, even give orders to it, bureau, bureaucracies have many, many ways in bureaucrats of avoiding reform because it affects them, it, it, it is disruptive and things of this nature. And that's across, across in all bureaucracies anywhere in the world that I've served. Uh, but what I saw and observed in Kazakhstan uh, over the last years I was there and, and even subsequently has been almost an increasing amount of control over uh, society in very subtle ways. I mean, there. when I first got to Kazakhstan, there was no ministry of information, no ministry of religion. Those appeared. And they were, why were they necessary? In a way, I was told it was to protect the freedoms and protect people from influences from outside. But in many respects, it was also to control. And these were basically for security reasons of controlling uh, the situation, controlling uh, what people were, were, were seeing and doing. Uh, and so, I, and I think while it was used as a, as it were, anti-terrorism, uh, if you will, operation, on the other hand, it closed the space for hearing other views and for their pluralism that a society needs. And I think what would be necessary, and again, I, I, I'm not it's hard in the United States itself, which is undergoing an effort to try to have cardinal reforms. And I see this now that I'm in my own country and the like too, and how difficult it is. But to be able to have a greater openness and sphere for other voices to come out, which is why having a media that can do investigations that is not under the control of government 
agencies uh, is, is so vitally important to getting other views and so that governments can feel that they're being held accountable, but they're also hearing directly from people. And the more, the more you can involve people from not within the government into the policy debate is, will be beneficial, I would say, for, uh, for, for this reform effort, which will be difficult all the same. Thank you. Uh, we, we received the uh, questions from Michael Laubsch about the external push. Yeah? Uh, what can be done externally to kind of facilitate, <laughs> facilitate the movement, the reforms in the uh, right direction? Um, so uh, Michael is asking, uh, our NGO collected a statement regarding economic sanctions against oligarchs from the old elite. Would this be an effective action by EU and US? Secondly, the investigations into the bloodshed. Can we trust um, a Republic of Kazakhstan investigation only, or should EU and US be involved? Uh, let's first deal with the oligarchs. Uh, is uh, kind of would economic, these targeted economic sanctions against uh, these oligarchs be, uh, be useful, effective? Um, who would want to take that? Gulaihan, do you want to take it? And maybe Iskander? I'm not sure Gulaihan is with us. Iskander, oh, oh Gulaihan, yes. Hi. Um, I don't have much to say about this topic, but uh, I remember from the uh, president's uh, message is that uh, the reforms that he's suggesting is not about taking away money and the wealth from wealthy people in Kazakhstan and redistributing it to poor people or forcing uh, this kind of economic sanctions. So um, I'm not sure about the efficiency of such uh, measures. So I wouldn't be sure how effective they can be. Um, yeah, that's uh, basically what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. Iskandar, do you have something to say on that? Uh, on the topic of uh, oligarchs giving money to the special fund, yeah? Uh, no, 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 no. It's uh, imposing sanctions on oligarchs from the old elite. Well, I, I think it's uh, up to the question from the EU and the US uh, sanctioning bodies. But I mean, uh, um, if you take the long-term process, it's certainly... Uh, whether it's going to be a politically motivated or economically motivated. So I think it's uh, two different aspects. So in this respect, uh, uh, we need to look at from the, 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 the context of bilateral US-Kazakhstan relations and how uh, this sanctioning process can affect bilateral relations in the very shifting geopolitical sense yeah, uh, of Central Asia, uh, Eurasia in general sense. So I think Kazakhstan... Um, as a proponent of multi-vector foreign policy, I would like certainly to have much more uh, constructive relations than before with the EU and uh, the US in this respect. So I believe that our current like, diplomats and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in uh, close contact with uh, their European and US colleagues on different matters. And I think the economic aspects which were raised are also part of the agenda. So uh, I may not have the whole information because I don't have any access to that official statements, uh, the official process of decision making. But I think uh, uh, this should be also discussed and uh, rightly negotiated. But on what grounds, maybe Michael can write in the chat on what grounds uh, would these sanctions be imposed? Um, what about the investigation? Uh, what's, what's your take? Do you think we can do it domestically as President Tokayev uh, says, or uh, do we need to make an international investigation or with involve, involvement of... Uh, like, I, I think that the best, I, yeah, I fully agree. Uh, like what, what is more important here is to engage with Kazakh society rather than just ask people from outside even the, the, with the best practice. I think uh, if we invite people from the different sectors, uh, from the human rights uh, organization, from NGOs, from the business sector, people who have much more credibility in the eyes of population, from the 
from maybe from different uh, polar views who may not sit on the same table, but if they are able to come uh, uh, to the same idea that we need a real clear uh, agenda, we need to have a clear process of investigation, I think it will be much more effective rather than having some somebody uh, from outside and assisting Kazakhstan in this process. So I think it's more important to uh, improve this consolidated uh, compromised approach because this kind of crisis may happen. I mean, not in the same scale, but in the future, we might we need to improve the culture of, of uh, collective investigation. And that's why I think this can be a really good moment to improve the, this process and, and, and instill a new culture, a new approach where people from different background can come and, and actually uh, have an impact on the, the decision-making process. We have a link to that question, but first I want to go to Tatiana. Tatiana, what do you think is the solution? About the investigation? Yes. Uh, we need to distinguish fact-finding from investigation. Uh, pure fact-finding or mere fact-finding is something probably what the foreigners might be involved in. And uh, I wouldn't fancy uh, to say whether that need to be EU structures or the US or it should be something complex. Um, it, it may be really something hybrid, uh, whether uh, when um, um, NGOs really or civil society people or experts may be involved, including with the foreigners and politicians from abroad, that's about the fact finding. So that we may be able to um, get or grasp uh, the whole picture of what really happened uh, and indeed happened in Kazakhstan. Because all the previous questions that we tried here to um, answer ourselves or to pose other first to ourselves, because um, we, we don't have answers to those questions. Who stood behind? We don't know who was standing behind. And we wish uh, we knew who was there. Unfortunately, I am not an optimist in that. I don't know when. <laughs> Uh, or if we'll be able to know or, or when it's going to be public or whether it's going to be public at all, uh, all those intricacies and, and implications. That's probably one of the reasons why Tokai said that he doesn't want or an international commission to be involved or an inve investigative body to be involved in that. As for the investigation part, uh, also we need to see what it is that we are going to investigate. Uh, if it is about um, human rights violations, then we are talking about the involvement of the government. Because human rights is always a person or people uh, versus the state, uh, or state versus the people. So, and yes, and here we are talking. Uh, probably here, not a um, certain country focused or centered. Uh, investigation, maybe I mean them, those who will be digging uh, into all those things. Um, it should rather be a UN body or, or OSCE body who should be doing this type of investigation. Or it can be totally independent of any structures, like for instance, Kill Union's Commission uh, was in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan when it was investigating the OSH events of 2010. It was not linked to any of the bodies or any of the government in particular. It, it was purely investigative. Uh, of course, it was not perfect. No, not of course. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what um, methodologically method, 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 methodically wise was wrong with it. Uh, but still, uh, there were very many commissions in uh, um, around the OSH events. Uh, who came that came to investigate it and still there's no clear one clear answer same in Kazakhstan I think the more commissions in fact the better but an international one a hybrid of a hybrid kind uh, uh, I would uh, prefer to see that kind of a commission for fact finding yeah, and for investigating human rights violations yes 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 I, I yes I, I, I agree with you um uh, well, actually, we, we have a question from Jonathan Berry. Uh, President Takayev speaks of some terrorists and hints that they come from some other Central Asian country. Will the events in Kazakhstan affect relations between the countries within the, the region? Uh, Iskander, probably will go to you. Well, um, I think there is... Uh... 
there was a such kind of statement that there were there was some uh, limited involvement from of uh, foreign hand and foreign first people from the uh, kind of regional states. Uh, we still don't know the name, but I mean, uh, we can get only can we can only guess. But I, uh, we, uh, I don't think that is going to affect really affect the relations between two states. There were many remarks for from uh, former politicians uh, from regional states on uh, kind of each other. The Central Asian cooperation and kind of rhetoric was going back and forth. It also we need to take into account that uh, the for a long time Central Asian uh, politics were personal politics of each leaders, like depending on their relations to each other. But these days, I think we, uh, do, I, I don't think that we are, it's going to really affect the relation. It's too big to fail. I mean, uh, if you speak economically, politically, this kind of rhetorics and this kind of statements may, will not affect the real politics, the real economy. Um, th th thank you very much. Uh, anybody else wants to add anything to that? No. Um, yes. Well, here maybe, okay, that would be part of the, the cool, right, investigation, right? Because clearly some, if there were terrorists, there were, um, uh, the, the, uh, that, was, that was kind of uh, prepared, this operation was prepared by somebody with an attempt to, uh, to change the system. But, but this investigation is just so delicate, I would, uh, I would uh, think, because uh, it's the political system that imploded, right? Uh, and President Takayev is the success of President Nazarbayev, and now he's trying to dismantle um, the uh, Nazarbayev, Nazarbayev system. So, so let's see uh, how that goes. Um, okay, the, we have a clarification from, from Michael Laubsch. Uh, there are billions of uh, US dollars placed in banks, real estate, company shares, stolen from the Kazakh people. And yes, Kazakh people know that. Um, I, I, I would think that there are two two possibilities here either the Kazakh government initiates uh, initiates investigations and try to uh, return the stolen assets um, I don't know how likely is that or the uh, or um, foreign governments uh, using their own anti-corruption yeah anti-corruption laws uh, do something I don't know I'm not an expert on this uh, maybe Ambassador Kroll knows something Yeah, well, it's 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 a very complicated situation because, uh, in my experience, you know, with these kinds of um, issues where there may be wealthy people from countries, uh, say from Kazakhstan or, or Uzbekistan or whatever, that have invested, for instance, in the United States, bought properties or whatever under various devices with, that don't even have their names on it, but they're trusts and corporate. It's, it's a very, it, it's, it's a system uh, that is uh, very much shrouded with, in, with legal and lawyers and all kinds of instruments of how people can do this. So that if a government such as the government of Kazakhstan and its legal authorities were to request the government of the United States to investigate certain people Kazakhstani citizens that may have this, this runs into issues of, well, who, how, how do you do this? And the protections within the United States system, uh, legal system of private property or, or investments and things like this. And this is truly, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, not just complicated, but sensitive issue uh, because a complainant uh, in in the United States would say, "Well, we're I'm being politically persecuted by the government of Kazakhstan, and you shouldn't be providing information for my client to." And, and so this gets into all kinds of legal complications um, for within the United States and the like. So you know the idea of sanctioning oligarchs and things like that it it sounds easy and simple. But is it really any effective in the ways that many people have of putting their money in places where they are secure and protected by law? And so this, 
it's not an easy solution to any of this, even if there is a cooperation between the investigative services of the United States and say the investigative services of, of Kazakhstan. So, um, and that's also, you see this in the UK and in many places where there are, there, there is a whole culture, if you're not a whole system and an apparatus that is in the business of protecting the investments and monies of people uh, who wish to put that money in the United States or, or in the UK. So uh, it's, it's something I've encountered and it's very difficult uh, to, to resolve because it requires even legislation and activities within countries like the United States and the UK and, and other places that are depositories for this to change the way they, uh, they can investigate and prosecute uh, these kind of um, activities while protecting the rights of, of people who invest. Thank, thank you very much. And we, uh, okay, we need to end our discussion here. Um, that was uh, that was an excellent discussion. Um, I was supposed to summarize it, but, uh, but uh, we don't have time. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure all the participants can summarize for themselves. Let me give the floor for, uh, for uh, the final remarks to Abahu and Sultan Nazar. Thank you very much, Nargis. Uh... They're all, you know, wrapping things up, I must admit that uh, today's discussion showed many important aspects of the existing problem in Kazakhstan. The panel shed more light on the reforms President Pakaev is uh, so determined to implement. Ambassador Kroll presented a very concept conceptualized view of Kazakhstan's development as someone who saw strategic policy making and action. Eskander rightfully noted some central uh, grievances in this uh, current political regime. He also brought some main political fault lines uh, into our clear view. Uh, Dr. Kubayeva, uh, her analysis provided a comprehensive outlook of the current state of affairs in Kazakhstan's economy and gave us great pointers as uh, to what to expect from the future reforms of the current ruling regime. And Tatiana Chernobyl, uh, Chernobyl outlined keep uh, problems of where Kazakhstan is heading in terms of civil society development and respect to human rights. Uh, I thank our speakers for being here with us tonight. Special gratitude goes to our even chair and moderator, Dr. Kasenova. Uh, I see here uh, Norwegian ambassador, uh, John uh, Kvistad and ambassador Oli. So they are present, uh, present here today. So I would like to thank you uh, for the continued support that you provide to us. I hope that everyone enjoyed the event and very soon we are publishing the panel highlights on our platform following tonight's event and uploading the video on our YouTube channel, Kabardot Asia. Thank you for your participation and have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you.